everyone, thanks for joining. We're going to get started now. Today we're joined by Dr. Brown, who will be presenting the science tables modeling. So I'll turn it over to him to get started. Thank you. Uh, and I'll apologize now, the, uh, when the presentation does start, uh, the uh, sign language, sorry, will stop, uh, but it will come back immediately after the presentation. Now, I'm back to you to speak with you today because of the emergence of the Omicron variant in Ontario. We're still learning about this new variant. It emerged only last month, but it's important to talk about what we do know. First, it transmits incredibly fast. Doubling time for cases may be down to just over two days now, compared to four days or more with previous variants. It does cause serious disease. Hospital rates have risen in South Africa, where it first took hold. It's not just a case of the sniffles. And our Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, particularly with a booster, provide strong protection against serious illness. And with the booster, they also provide protection against infection. The Omicron variant transmits fast enough that it is already the dominant variant in Ontario. It is not clear whether it will completely replace the Delta variant, but it is clear that it will shortly account for the overwhelming majority of cases. We are still learning much about this variant, about mortality, its relationship with long COVID and other issues, but the broad picture of being highly transmissible and serious is clear. I'll present modelling today based on the work of five teams from across Ontario. The modeling shows that cases will likely dramatically increase very soon. We, like other strong modeling teams from around the world, believe that it is best to treat the Omicron variant as if, as if it were as serious as the Delta variant. But our modeling also shows that whether it is as serious as Delta or 25% less likely to produce serious illness, our hospitals will still face incredibly strong pressures. This will come at an already challenging time when healthcare workers are fatigued or burned out from the preceding waves. If we want to blunt this wave, and please note that I'm saying blunt it, not flatten it, we will need to reduce contacts between people. I believe we can do this without closing schools or shutting down businesses that have suffered during previous waves. But it will take serious restrictions that reduce contacts. This is a hard decision. At the same time, we need to drive boosters up as high as possible to protect vulnerable individuals and vulnerable communities. And we need to keep vaccinating kids. But neither public health measures nor vaccinations will be enough on their own to blunt the Omicron wave. Public health measures will slow the spread of Omicron, but they are not sustainable in the long run. Vaccination provides our exit plan from the pandemic, but it takes a while to take effect. Regardless of the policies that will be enacted, we should recognize that we are fortunate to have the capacity to provide boosters when many countries are struggling to provide first doses. We should remember that our choices help limit the spread of the disease. Wearing a high quality mask properly, physical distancing when indoors, improving ventilation wherever possible, increasing access to rapid testing, they all help and they help make sure that we can keep schools open and keep sectors hard hit by the pandemic working. This will likely be the hardest wave of the pandemic. But if we can control it and drive vaccination as hard as we can, we can make it to the exit. And there is an exit plan from the pandemic. We just need to push as hard as we can and control its immediate impact as much as we can tolerate. I started by saying that we are still learning about the pandemic. There is still some uncertainty, but there's also an undeniable urgency. Waiting to take action means waiting till it is too late to take action. Now, on to the key messages and numbers. Uh, and my apologies, the ASL translation will disappear for a few minutes while we do the presentation, and we'll return for questions. We can go to the presentation, please. Let me start with the key findings. Cases are climbing across most public health units. Uh, and when we put together these slides the other day, we felt that it would be soon that the Omicron variant would be the dominant variant it is likely the dominant variant already today. <clears throat> Omicron transmits very quickly. Early evidence suggests that it can produce severe disease, and without prompt intervention, we expect that ICU occupancy, a key measure in our fight against this pandemic, could reach unsustainable levels in early January. 
Although vaccines are less effective against the Omicron infection, boosters can substantially increase protection. And even two doses of our mRNA vaccines likely provide strong protection against severe illness. The risk of severe illness is dramatically higher in the unvaccinated. We can help protect the most vulnerable with vaccination, meaning here both children and the use of boosters. Rapid rollout of booster doses is essential with a strong focus on the most vulnerable, people in long-term care, people in shelters, people in high-risk communities, and on healthcare workers. Increasing vaccination is not enough to slow this wave. We'll talk today about circuit breakers with strong additional public health measures, reducing contacts down by about 50% or more, and strong booster campaigns of about 250,000 per day as a way to blunt the wave. As well, continued use of public health measures, use of high quality masks, physical distancing indoors, improved ventilation, and increased access to rapid testing can help buy time for boosters to take effect and keep schools open. Although uncertainty persists, waiting for more information will eliminate the opportunity for action. I'll start here uh, just to put the situation in Ontario in a global context. Uh, the left-hand panel shows the growth in COVID-19 cases. Uh, that is uh, both Delta and the uh, beginnings of the uh, Omicron wave. Uh, the next panel, the middle panel, shows COVID-19 patients in ICU. Uh, as you can see there in that red line, we've been lucky in terms of keeping our ICU rates roughly stable, but uh, there is significant rises in other parts of the world. And you can see here on the final panel on the right-hand side, uh, COVID-19 deaths. Turning to Ontario, uh, we show this slide, I think, every briefing. Uh, you can see that cases are increasing in most public health units. Uh, and this chart, unfortunately, from uh, the other day is already out of date. Uh, rates in uh, public health units like uh, Kingston, Fronac, Atlanta, uh, <coughs> excuse me, KFLA, uh, are uh, much higher already. Uh, and you can see them growing across a number of these uh, public health units uh, if we update it to today's date. Here I want to show uh, a story about uh, Omicron and the Delta variant. Uh, the left-hand panel in the blue shows the dramatic increase in Omicron. I want you to look at the slope there. It's very, very steep. Uh, but you can see there is still growth in Delta at the same time, but a much less steep slope. And so important to kind of note that uh, we have a dramatically more transmissible disease here in Ontario. This is Ontario data with Omicron. Uh, but we have seen, uh, up until now at least, a uh, continuing increase uh, in the Delta variant as well. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about South Africa and the uh, experience particularly in one of its provinces called Gauteng uh, as being evidence of Omicron's lower severity. Uh, but I'm going to show two slides now that talk about whether or not that is a, a reasonable assumption about the severity of Omicron. Uh, if you look at the left-hand panel, I'd again like you to take a look at the slope of the lines. Uh, the blue line uh, dealing with the left axis, uh, is, sorry, the blue line dealing with the right axis is COVID-19 patients in hospitals. Uh, the orange line is COVID-19 patients in ICU. Uh, the uh, softer uh, orange line is receiving mechanical ventilation. And the yellow line uh, is with supplementary oxygen. You can see that all of these indications of the severity of the disease are trending up. Thankfully, the ventilation indicator is not trending up as quickly. But there is reason to suspect that that will start to come up. That's uh, generally a lagging indicator. Uh, if you look over on the right-hand panel, uh, you can see deaths in hospital uh, in Gauteng again, and that is also trending up. Uh, but I want to caution even uh, maybe a very small amount of optimism on what we see here should be very, very, very uh, muted. Uh, Gauteng is a much younger province. Uh, the average age is 27, sorry, the median age there is 27 years. Uh, the median age in Ontario is 41 years, and age is still one of the most important factors uh, predicting outcomes. Uh, you have a, a number of people who've already been infected uh, with COVID-19, uh, and that gives them a certain degree of immunity. Uh, that's a much lower number here in Ontario. Uh, and we have a number of people in, uh, in Gauteng and in South Africa who have probably both had two vaccines and a previous infection, giving them a higher level of immunity. Uh, the number here in Ontario is probably half of that uh, or less. Uh, and so you can see that this is still a serious disease in a younger population uh, that is at less risk of serious outcomes. It's still a serious disease in a country where there's been a substantial amount 
uh, of infection conferring some degree of immunity. And it's still a serious disease uh, in a country that has seen high mortality in previous waves, uh, showing that it's still able to find people uh, and have uh, serious consequences. I'll go here again to um, three slides again, talking about what's going on uh, in South Africa. The left-hand panel is the slope of cases. Uh, wave four, this is Omicron, is there in orange, and you can see that it's that very sharp line uh, straight up uh, on the left-hand side of the left-hand panel. The middle line is admissions to hospitals. And again, uh, you know, we've shown all the waves here on these charts, but that orange line uh, at the far left side, you can see that slope up again. That is the slope for hospitalizations uh, in this fourth wave, and you can see it taking off in the same way. Uh, the far right-hand panel is deaths. Uh, you can see that that is lower. Uh, I think we need to wait to interpret this statistic because deaths would be uh, a very much the, the lagging indicator. Uh, but it is increasing, but thankfully now not increasing uh, as much. Uh, maybe to also give a sense of where we are in terms of uh, penetration of Omicron, in about November 15th, uh, South Africa hit 50%, and about two weeks later, uh, they saw the increase in hospitalization. We're here in Ontario today on December 16th, where South Africa was on November 15th. So we should start to see that hospitalization rise uh, in a very short period of time uh, as we get to see Omicron be the dominant variant. Uh, this data is uh, from Denmark, uh, and it is early data. I want to emphasize it's very early data. Uh, but if you again look at the slopes of these lines in that chart, uh, cases are going up and hospital occupancy with COVID-19 is going up. Uh, and if you look at the table underneath, you can see that the risk uh, not really the risk, but the percentage of people who are hospitalized uh, with Omicron is about the same as were hospitalized with other strains. Now, this is early data, and it's important to emphasize it's early data, but you can see that uh, it's actually roughly uh, the same. And as we look around other jurisdictions, uh, for instance, looking at uh, data that was on social media today from the United Kingdom, uh, there is no sign of a decoupling between cases and hospitalizations. We see that rise again in hospitalizations in the United Kingdom. Uh, we've seen a substantial jump uh, in the number of patients in hospital in London, uh, England over the last little while. And to perhaps give a sense of how quickly this spreads, uh, if we go back to Denmark, uh, they reported nearly 10,000 new cases this morning. Uh, that's on a population of 5.8 uh, million people. So a very, very transmissible disease that grows very quickly, uh, a disease that does have serious consequences, at least in terms of hospitalization when we look at it, uh, let's turn to uh, the effectiveness of vaccines. Uh, the chart here shows the effectiveness of the um, mRNA vaccines, or actually in this case, I'm sorry, it's the Pfizer vaccine, uh, of the Pfizer vaccine against the Delta variant and against the Omicron variant. Uh, the black squares are the Delta variant, and the gray circles are the Omicron variant, and you can see as we move along the chart, as we move farther and farther away uh, from that second dose, you see the effectiveness of all of those vaccines wane. Uh, and you can see the effectiveness against uh, Omicron is lower. Uh, but I think important to note that the booster increases that effectiveness dramatically again. That's the far uh, right-hand uh, piece of data. Uh, and you can see that the uh, effectiveness uh, goes up again substantially for both the gray uh, circles and the black squares for both the Delta and the Omicron variant. Really, I think, uh, reinforcing uh, the importance uh, of uh, boosters uh, for preventing symptomatic, and, uh, sorry, for preventing symptomatic infection uh, and actually for preventing uh, infection as well. Now, this is a very dense slide, and I'm not going to read it out, but we thought it was important, uh, given that we are both coping with emerging evidence, but also the seriousness uh, and the substantially different threat posed by Omicron, uh, to have a slide that detailed some of our assumptions. Uh, I've already talked about uh, doubling time being down now around two days. Uh, the uh, R effective is the highest we've ever seen at around 4.5, I think, today on our dashboard. Uh, so this is a disease that transmits very, very, very uh, quickly uh, and very widely. Uh, and it's important to note here that, you know, we've used those data uh, when we've done these estimations. Um, we have assumed, uh, based on the data that I just presented, that uh, Omicron uh, creates as serious health consequences as the Delta variant. Uh, we have also, though, modeled 25% uh, less uh, severe uh, cases. 
uh, based on some uh, early data out of South Africa that it suggested in some populations uh, this might be the case. Uh, and we have modeled uh, vaccine effectiveness uh, as I discussed. Uh, when we get into the modeling, you'll see uh, wide ranges. This is, of course, based on trying to understand how different assumptions affect these ranges. Uh, but I will talk about where the preponderance of the estimates go and where we uh, expect things to be. So again, this is modeling based on the work of five teams. Uh, we bring it together to try to create a consensus estimate so that we're not having uh, movement uh, too much in one direction uh, or another. Uh, if you look at the red area, this is where we expect cases to be uh, between now and the 1st of January uh, if there are no additional measures. This does include continued progress on uh, historical averages of booster doses. Uh, you can see there's a wide range here uh, with the high end range uh, taking us up to uh, over 10,000 cases very quickly. Uh, a lower end range that still takes us up very high to uh, over uh, 6,000 cases uh, by the end of the month. Uh, and you can see uh, really what is driving that sort of wide range there is assumptions about vaccine effectiveness. Uh, the lower range, obviously, is we believe vaccines are 100% effective, which we uh, know at least or believe from the uh, data so far that they are not. You can also see a green area there at a much lower level of cases that does not get uh, as high as our historic uh, daily case report uh, high levels. Uh, this is what we've described as a circuit breaker. This is where you would see a substantial amount of vaccination, really equivalent to about 250,000. Uh, to 350,000 booster doses and vaccinations for children a day, uh, and a substantial reduction in contacts. It's not a lockdown, it's not a stay-at-home order, uh, but it does require reduction uh, in contacts. Here, I uh, just wanted to kind of show a chart again that we always show. Uh, we've been relatively stable for the last little while in hospitalization and ICU occupancy. Uh, that is good. Uh, but you can see just at the tail end of the chart now, and again, this only goes uh, to about uh, the 8th or 9th of December, uh, there has been an increase over the last four weeks, uh, both in the number of COVID inpatients, about a 25% increase, and uh, an increase in the number of patients in ICUs with uh, COVID. Uh, and that's been, again, about a 25% increase. So we are already trending up, and we have not yet seen uh, the impact of the spread of Omicron. And of course, uh, the spread of Omicron, if it is as serious uh, as we believe it is, will cause ICU use to rise substantially. Uh, with no additional measures, we expect that it would easily be over uh, 400 uh, or 500 uh, cases uh, in the ICU, ICU uh, by the end of this month and could be uh, substantially higher under our worst case scenarios. Uh, you can see that the a circuit breaker does help reduce the impact uh, of uh, the Omicron variant on our ICUs, but it still does uh, get up over uh, 300 on the number of those sort of uh, circuit breaker type scenarios. So wide, wide, wide range, but still most of our uh, scenarios uh, and most of our, um, uh, where we're actually with our current trend right now, suggest that we are tending towards the higher end uh, of the uh, red area. Now, uh, one of the concerns that has been raised, or one of the issues that has been raised, is uh, Omicron may be less severe than Delta. Uh, we don't believe there is strong evidence of that for a number of reasons that uh, we discussed earlier. Uh, but you can see here that even if Omicron is less severe, if it's 25% less uh, severe than Delta, uh, you will still see ICU occupancy rise. Uh, with no additional measures, again, our, measures tend to, our uh, models tend to suggest that by the end of the month, we could still be over 500. Uh, patients in the intensive care unit, uh, and even with a circuit breaker, we still do get up uh, to just about uh, 300 again. So um, the high transmissibility means that the decrease in severity has to be so substantial uh, to make up for that high spread of the disease. Uh, I think important to note as well, um, although it will, uh, there will be breakthrough infections, people who are unvaccinated are at greater, substantially greater risk. They are at the greatest risk uh, of ending up uh, in ICUs. Now, we've made uh, a lot of progress on vaccine coverage uh, across a number of groups. Uh, if you look here at the left-hand panel, uh, we're talking about vaccine coverage uh, for Ontarians between the ages of 5 and 64 years. 
Uh, the left-hand set of bars is people who've had at least one dose. Uh, the right hand, the middle set of, uh, set of bars is people who've had two doses. And the far right-hand set of bars in that left-hand panel is people who've had three doses. Uh, you can see that actually we have a substantial number of people uh, who've had two doses, but almost no one who's had three doses. Now, I want to talk about which uh, of the, uh, what each of the types of colors mean here, what each bar means. Yellow are individuals with any high-risk condition. Uh, the analysis done at ICES helps us understand people who are at greater risk uh, of disease uh, and serious outcomes. Uh, you can see it is the highest, um, but still substantially below where we'd want to see it uh, to truly provide protection to uh, people who are highly vulnerable. The orange bar shows people who don't have any of those conditions listed. So they're still at risk, uh, but it's a lower risk. Uh, and we've shown here the blue bar, uh, people with recent experience with homelessness, who are at great risk, uh, crowded conditions, high-risk conditions in shelters, uh, other issues that cause a, a greater risk of serious disease, and you can see it is quite low. Uh, and again, you see that same pattern uh, for people who've uh, had a third dose in that, uh, in that chart. And so very, very low uh, third dose coverage for a lot of people who are at very high risk. Uh, if we look uh, on the right-hand panel, we can look at vaccine coverage uh, over 65 years of age. Uh, and you can see here uh, that we have a better coverage, which is good because age is a critical factor uh, in understanding risk. But again, you can see across all of those bars a decrement. And again, although it's higher than uh, those who are younger, you have a much lower level uh, of vaccination with three doses. So looking at this, it is really critical as we hit uh, the surge in Omicron cases uh, that people get their booster dose as soon as they can uh, because it does take a while uh, for the effect to kick in. So this is a very, very challenging situation and it's a very challenging uh, set of data to present because although there is uncertainty uh, about some of the parameters uh, and we try to make uh, clear our assumptions in all of this modeling, there is an incredible urgency because of the speed uh, of which it spreads. Uh, what I do want to point out is that uh, despite the seriousness, with prompt action, we can slow down and we can reduce some of the impact of this wave. Uh, so we've talked a lot about circuit breakers. Uh, they really uh, slow down infection and give us time to get boosters into people and for those boosters to work. Uh, accelerating as fast as we can, not just broad boosters, but boosters for the most vulnerable, uh, and for healthcare workers and their families and caregivers will help reduce the transmission to vulnerable people and help protect the health workforce. Uh, the reason that we've talked, uh, called out families here of healthcare workers is that that helps protect against household transmission, which could then lead to transmission back into a hospital, back into a long-term care home. Uh, and so we're trying to create uh, really as great a level uh, of security with this uh, advice uh, around healthcare facilities as we can. Um, regardless, we can help keep schools and workplaces uh, and places where people gather indoors safe by reinforcing, or at least uh, safer by reinforcing the importance of key behaviors and public health measures. Uh, although we've talked about uh, vaccination and we've talked about boosters already a lot, obviously the first thing is please uh, get your booster. Uh, please wear a well-fitted, high-quality mask. Do uh, practice physical distancing and avoid indoor spaces where there's crowding. If you can, increase ventilation in indoor spaces and make sure that you use rapid testing. Uh, it'll be important that we match the distribution of therapeutics, drugs. Uh, there are some that now help. There are monoclonal antibody treatments that help uh, to where they're needed most to mitigate the impact of potential shortages. Uh, and it, it's important to point out that although uncertainty persists, uh, waiting for more information will eliminate the opportunity for action. Anything that we can do here helps and we will all need to help to control and help blunt the impact of the Omicron variant uh, as we try to get through this wave. I'll uh, have this as my sort of second last slide, just as a visual. Uh, almost, uh, there's, sorry, there's no type of uh, thing that you can do that is 100% protective, uh, but there are a series of things that you can do that help substantially reduce the risk of infection. And so first and foremost, the always category, Please get vaccinated. Uh, it is, as I said earlier on, the exit plan from this pandemic. Please wear uh, a mask indoors. Please, if you can, stay outdoors or in well-ventilated spaces. And when it's possible, please practice physical distancing. And if you can, please avoid large gatherings. 
I won't repeat the key findings other than to emphasize that this is a very, very different variant. Uh, and it may be closed by saying that although this is an incredible threat, uh, both to health and to our uh, health system, we do have a tremendous amount on which to base hope, not least of which are the vaccines. But it must be hope built on action. Anything that we can do now, whether as an individual or as a province, will help. And please, please get vaccinated uh, as soon as you can. Uh, with that, uh, that's the end of the uh, slideshow. I'll just go one more. And uh, the uh, contributors uh, and the members of uh, the science and modeling tables are here. Uh, and I'm grateful for their support and their uh, incredible work over the last uh, 18 months. I'm pleased to be able to serve with them. Thank you. Lines for questions. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. From Chris Verharp at CP24. Hello, Dr. Brown. Uh, what else beyond limiting indoor capacity in venues with a thousand or more regular occupants do you think is needed when you speak of new public health measures? And how does this model specifically define a circuit breaker? So uh, on the last question, you know, the, there's a range with a circuit breaker that we're considering. What we're really talking about when we talk about a circuit breaker is reducing contacts uh, by 50% uh, and uh, pushing uh, the level of vaccine administration, boosters and to children, and even uh, first vaccines, up to about a total of 250,000 to 350,000 a day. Uh, it's, um, it's the question about the public health measures. It's specifically those things that reduce contacts. And so that may be capacity limitations in different settings. Uh, it may be a stronger enforcement of masking indoors. Uh, I think we've all seen um, some diminution uh, in people actually following, you know, wearing, uh, wearing a mask properly. Uh, it's not really anything set of uh, any sort of new things uh, that we haven't seen before. It's those core uh, public health measures. What do you make of the suggestion by some epidemiologists and health leaders that everyone in the province, regardless of how they limit their contacts or their vaccination status, should just offhand expect to experience COVID-19 infection in the next month or so because of the, the unbelievably increased transmission uh, compared to previous variants? Is this a credible assertion based on what we know? The data is very clear that this is incredibly transmissible. Uh, if we were seeing in uh, Toronto or the greater Toronto area the type of explosion of cases that they've seen, uh, say in uh, Kingston, you might have 10 to 20,000 cases in the GTA uh, right now. And so this is an incredibly transmissible disease. Uh, and the levels of infection that we see in other jurisdictions are really high. I do believe that if there was strong public health measures, you would be able to blunt that transmission by enough to buy some time for boosters. That might mean that there still is broad spread, uh, but I do think that you, uh, you can control some of that transmission. Next question. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, Professor Brown. You said you don't believe the evidence shows Omicron is less severe. Yet the Public Health Agency of Canada said the other day, I quote, all cases to date have been asymptomatic or mild. Uh, the other day, the EU CDC said all cases in the EU for which there is available information on severity were either mild or asymptomatic. Uh, we see prominent doctors in various countries have taken to the mainstream airwaves to insist that this has been mild. Uh, so my question is, well, why should the public accept the Ontario Science Table's perspective on the severity issue over all those other voices? So I showed you earlier on in the presentation the data from Denmark uh, that, you know, is publicly available data. Uh, I think it's worth taking a look at, but that does show a similar risk of hospitalization, which I would consider a serious health outcome. Uh, we've looked at the data from South Africa that is now starting to show that trend upwards. Uh, and even the data out of South Africa talked about a 23 percent, this is the most optimistic data, a 23 percent diminution in hospitalization. That's not sniffles. Uh, that is hospitalization. Uh, which is a very serious health outcome. Follow-up? Yeah, speaking of hospitalizations, I understand the prevailing concerns justifying the measures you recommend are that we will see 400 or 500 persons in the ICU. A massive amount of the provincial budget goes into the healthcare system, and there are a lot of people paid a lot of money to manage this system. But why do you think it is that they have failed to properly manage for this presumably preventable moment where the burden is now once again expected to fall on regular people. 
I think that's an unfair uh, statement about some very, very hard work by people within our system over the last while. Uh, if uh, you take a look at what they've done in terms of moving patients around the province to try to manage load, uh, if you look at how hard doctors and nurses have worked, I don't think that uh, the assertion that they've mismanaged and failed uh, the people of Ontario is, is fair or true. Next question. From Jeff Gray at the Globe and Mail. Oh, hi, thanks. Uh, Dr. Brown, just, just about the circuit breaker, you know, the start date that you modeled December 15th, which is yesterday. Um, you know, this weekend there's kids playing hockey in tournaments. There's people shopping. Restaurants are still at full capacity. Uh, the, are, these are all things that should, uh, should be stopping, aren't they, by, by, if I look at these graphs? As we talk about almost every time uh, when we do these, uh, these briefings, if you want to control the growth in cases and you want to control the uh, impact on the health and health system, you have to reduce capacity and it would need to start now. Uh, because of the speed with which it spreads, um, the cases that we see today, the cases that we see tomorrow, the cases that we see on Sunday, uh, will be the hospitalizations in two or three weeks from now. Uh, and so uh, every day that you wait, you've got bigger spread and you've got a, um, a greater challenge in front of you. Now, I, I've talked a lot about, you know, the uncertainty and the urgency. It's a very, very challenging place to model right now. Uh, I've tried to talk about why we think it is as serious. Um, but, you know, these are, I, I recognize that these are very, very hard decisions. Uh, and I don't think that we need to uh, necessarily stop things uh, full out. I do think it's important to kind of maintain... Uh, activity in a number of very hard-hit business sectors, maintain kids at school. Next question. Uh, just to follow up on that, I mean, school is about to close um, for the holidays. Uh, does, does that help us at all? I mean, or are we going to have to issue, uh, you know, an order that says families shouldn't gather for Christmas? I think that's really the decision of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, if we're able to uh, increase vaccination, uh, if you're able to make sure that you're uh, associating with people who are vaccinated, uh, if you're able to increase ventilation as much as you can, if you're doing all the things like wearing a mask properly, uh, I think it is okay to see some family at Christmas, but that's really the purview of uh, Dr. Moore. Next question. From Colin DeMello at CTV News. Uh, hi, good morning, Dr. Brown. I know this always puts you in a very tricky position uh, to comment on the, the policies that the government brought into place. But, uh, you know, yesterday we saw capacity limits at large venues with 1,000 plus cut down to 50 percent. In your view, and that's only coming into effect on 12 at 12.01 on Saturday, in your view, the measures that were announced yesterday, will they be enough to avoid that 10,000 a day scenario? So anything in that, uh, any measures will help reduce, uh, but they're not enough to really uh, curb the rapid growth uh, of the variant. Follow-up? Okay, and so if you can clarify then, what specifically additional does the government need to do in order to you know, blunt the wave to, to a degree where we don't overwhelm the hospitals? And if I can also add on just about the airborne nature of this virus, do you agree that the Omicron variant or COVID-19 in general is airborne, and what specific type of mask is uh, necessary uh, to protect healthcare workers, teachers, and the general public? Sure. So I think that's three follow-up questions. Um, <laughs> let me start on one of them. It's an airborne disease. Um, I think that's clear. Uh, I think the highest quality mask you can get uh, is, uh, is useful. I think there's broader questions that should be addressed about um, types of masks and so on, and I think uh, there's guidance coming out on that shortly, uh, but those should go to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Next question. From Lorenda Redekop at CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Brown. We've got bars and restaurants still at 100%. Nightclubs are still operating, and this at a time when we've got Christmas and New Year's just around the corner. What would be your recommendation to the government and also to the people of Ontario? So to the people of Ontario would be, I think, very clear. Please uh, get your booster. Uh, if for some reason you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please go get vaccinated. Uh, that 
protects not only you, but it protects people around you. Uh, the points that we, uh, you know, we talk about that uh, second last slide about all the layers of protection, please do wear a high quality mask. Uh, please uh, do try to physically distance. Uh, please don't get yourself in crowded indoor spaces where there's poor ventilation. Those are all uh, important things that people can do. And it's, it, uh, you know, the nature of the disease uh, has accelerated. It's much more transmissible. Uh, with the Delta variant, we saw it become uh, more severe. Uh, but the fundamentals of how we control spread uh, haven't changed, uh, although they may be less effective. Uh, in terms of uh, what we can do at a provincial level, you know, we've considered models where we're dropping contacts between people by at least 50 percent. Uh, that would require capacity limitations of some sort. Uh, it would require different approaches to making sure that um, uh, people are not engaging in uh, the type of behavior that's going to lead to, uh, to an increased risk of transmission. Um, but there's, a, combina there's a, a variety of different sort of ways that you could approach that. Follow up. You were asked many months ago if your presentation at the time was predicting a disaster. You say that this will likely be the hardest wave of the pandemic. What is this presentation predicting? So it, it's predicting a remarkably uh, rapid increase in the number of cases. Uh, and that in itself is worrisome. Uh, we don't know the relationship between this variant yet and long COVID or post-acute COVID. Uh, and so you are uh, putting a whole bunch of people at uh, potential risk. Uh, earlier variants uh, had a, uh, a risk of uh, long COVID of perhaps maybe 10% uh, with different types of symptoms. Uh, at the same time, if our assumptions about severity uh, are right, uh, you'll also see a huge increase in hospitalization, uh, which is challenging to, uh, to manage with you know, consequences for health. And if it, uh, the assumptions are correct, uh, an increase in ICU use uh, to the point that the ICUs are uh, unsustainable, uh, likely uh, sometime in January. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously increases in mortality as well. I'm trying to be very careful here to say, based on the assumptions we're making, I'm trying to make clear where we're getting the data for those assumptions. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. The challenge is, though, that we um, didn't want to wait uh, another week to release our usual modeling uh, as we get more and more data because the opportunity for action does shrink. And so it could be uh, a very, very, very significant hit on the health uh, of Ontarians and on the healthcare system. Uh, and it could be, uh, as you know, I said in my uh, presentation, it could be the worst wave of the pandemic yet. Last question. From Rob Ferguson at the Toronto Star. Uh, hello, Dr. Brown. Uh, just wondering, um, just getting back to the circuit breaker stuff, I, I was out for a walk last evening and I saw people crowded in gyms, crowded in bars with live music. Um, what, what is your advice to people who are still going to gyms and, and whatnot uh, and, and, and bars? Um, what would you like to see there? Should, should people just be seated at tables and uh, leave it at that with capacity restrictions? So I, I think this is a uh, this is a really hard question because it is a question that you know you have to consider both uh, the impact on these businesses uh, and the impact on the spread of the pandemic and it's um, it's not a question I'd ever want to be faced with making a decision on. I do think that anything we do here to reduce contacts will be helpful in controlling the pandemic. I do think that if you saw capacity reductions, um, you would actually. Um, you would uh, see uh, some break, hopefully, on the spread of the disease. Uh, but I know it's hard. I know it's hard to go to the gym and find out that it's crowded and have to leave. I know that it's hard to go to, um, you know, the place, a, a local restaurant or a local bar that you go to every week and see it's crowded and, and not go in. Uh, I understand that. But I think anything we can do to reduce, uh, you know, at a societal level, reduce uh, crowded places is helpful. And avoiding really crowded places an individual will probably help break um, uh, this, uh, this wave. Follow up, and this is the last question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we haven't seen you for a while. What happened there? Well, there wasn't much to discuss during the summer. Uh, as we've come back to modeling in the fall, uh, we have put it out publicly. Uh, and I will come to present the results any time that it's, uh, we're invited to come present it. Thanks, everyone.